Just to introduce myself, my name is Jim Galbraith. I'm the head of collection development at um, Binghamton University. Forgot for a second where I was. Um, <laughs> I'm also the subject librarian for uh, history and classics, and my co-presenter for today is? Hi, I'm Stephanie Hess. I'm the electronic resources librarian. I probably don't need a microphone, but yeah, I'm pretty loud. I'm also the subject librarian for um, environmental studies, geology, and I hand handle maps as well. And we'll be uh, presenting together, as you can tell. Um, so before we begin, we just wanted to say a few thank yous. And uh, first of all, welcome and thank you all for coming here this afternoon. Uh, thank you to the committee and uh, the people associated with the Charleston Conference for uh, choosing our presentation for this. And um, finally, maybe more of a personal, thank you very much for putting us in the up and coming category. I turned 50 this year, and just having my name associated with the phrase up and coming has helped ease the pain tremendously. I really appreciate it, and uh, thanks again for doing that. Um, what we'd like to do today is talk to you about the big deal and the experiences Binghamton University has had with the big deal over the course of the past year. In keeping with the theme um, and the thread of, of the conversation, we'll try to provide some basic information about the big deal and dig, then dig into a little more detail about what we've been looking at over the past year with a couple of the big deals we've been working with, both as an institution and through the SUNY system. Oh, thank you. For, uh, thanks. <laughs> First of all, I want to start by giving you just a little bit of background on Binghamton University. Binghamton University was founded in 1946. It uh, started off as a liberal arts college. Uh, not coincidentally, um, that's around the time the GI Bill was passed, so it was a one of the colleges that was formed as a result of that bill and the demand for more um, educational opportunities. Over the years, Binghamton University has evolved from a smaller liberal arts institution into a, gr a, a university that grants PhDs. We are now one of the four SUNYs that are research universities, the others being uh, Buffalo, Albany, and Stony Brook. Uh, the SUNY system is the largest of the state um, of the public university systems. We have 64 campuses. It's good to keep in mind that that's a combination of universities, colleges, technical colleges, as well as community colleges. So we have quite a mix of, of different types of institutions included in that, in, in that group. As the chart indicates, we are still, despite all of the new graduate programs that have, been, that have been coming up, still primarily an undergraduate institution. You can see that um, just in the statistics there. That is a situation that's um, changing very rapidly on campus. We're introducing a lot of new graduate programs at this point, including a number of professional programs. And I know a number of you are familiar with this phenomenon where we're adding things like nursing programs as well as pharmacy programs in response to the demand for, for more training in those areas. Like a lot of your institutions, we also have a number of big deals. We wanted to make, since we're going to be talking about them, we wanted to make sure we, we told you a little bit about the ones we currently have. We really are maintaining four large big deals at this point. A total of $2.35 million, which is about 32% of our budget. Uh, the notable, well, you see the SAGE is the smallest, the largest of our big deals is, um, not surprisingly, I think to many people, our Elsevier big deal. Um, we currently do not have a big deal with Taylor and Francis. I think that's one of the notable exceptions on this list. I've only been at Binghamton for a couple of years. I'm not sure exactly why we haven't done one of those in the past. I do know uh, that it has been very helpful for, with, for us as la of late not having a big deal with Taylor and Francis. We had a budget cut last year that I'm going to be referencing a couple times during the presentation. And frankly, Taylor and Francis titles were the easiest for us to cancel because we weren't locked into a big deal. And so when you think about the advantages, disadvantages of the big deal, that was obviously a really, um, for us, it was beneficial even if it was painful to actually have to cut those titles. So let's take a little history lesson here. Um, as always, we go down the rabbit hole. Um, it's no surprise to any of us that su subscription prices of scholarly journals have been increasing at a much faster rate than in, in inflation for the past several decades. Uh, this kind of came to the he head in the, in the uh, early 1990s when escalating serial costs and declining library budgets created a vicious cycle. And I think we, many of us are familiar with that. Uh, libraries wouldn't be able to afford a particular uh, title subscription, so they would cancel it, and that would cause loss of revenue for our publishers, and they would have to raise the prices on other journals. And again, libraries would see the new price, say, can't afford it, and cancel. So it set up this 
Lovely vicious cycle. Um, Dr. Jan Veltrop, uh, how many are familiar with him or his work? All right, yeah. He's a big open access advocate, actually. But um, when he started out, he was a marine geophysicist. And then he start, went into science public, publishing in the 1970s. Um, at this point in the 1990s, he was about 1993, he was, uh, at that point, the European Managing Director at Associated Press. And he was looking at the data, and he created a rather frightening graph um, that extrapolated what AP would have to charge for a typical journal uh, title if its subscription base fell to just that one title. Um, and that was so frightening that they worked out a plan. Um, and that is where we get the big deal model that was based on his research and the research of others um, in the publishing field at the time. So of course, this time, at this point in time, the challenge was compounded by the shift from uh, print format to electronic. Um, it was a pretty new thing, not sure how to control it. Um, to quote Dr. Veltrop, uh, we feared there would be massive administrative overhead of authentication of different portfolios of journals to different customers. Certainly a valid fear. Um, but anyhow, in about, took a couple of years, but then eventually AP uh, managed to convince uh, the Higher Education Funding Council of England uh, to sign its first big deal with AP, and that went into effect in January 1996. So that's how it started. But of course, that's not the end of our story. Um, the points I just mentioned are actually covered by Richard Poinder's uh, very good article. It's a little bit dated, but it gives good historical context. So that's why I'm recommending it. And then more recently, we can see um, that is it such a big deal on the cost of journal use in the di digital era from September 2018 um, gives a lot more uh, uh, review of what um, the impact of the big deal has been. Uh, the title of this particular uh, presentation, you know, Long Live the King, the King, the King is Dead, Long Live the King, um, is kind of our salute to, you know, that smooth transition, like what's going on? You want to have a smooth transition from this big deal to something new. Um, so in this particular case, I cannot recommend highly enough Spark's Big Deal database and their Big Deal cancellation tracker. The nice thing about the Big Deal, how many of you are familiar with Spark? All right, okay. Um, I figured you were. <laughs> but uh, the Big Deal database uh, it lists all of the big deals that um, of, of various institutions who have contributed their data. You can go in and look at it and see what are people paying. You can filter by institution. Um, you can see the different um, contracts that they're using. And then, of course, the, more recently, the big deal cancellation tracker has been very active. So again, this is uh, more information you can use to leverage in your negotiations. So I highly recommend those two resources. So in a nutshell, what's the big deal? Well, publishers bundle their journals into a single package at a significant discount over the aggregate list prices of the journals. Seems simple enough. Um, but in practice, the big, a big deal might consist of hundreds or even thousands of titles sold in a one price, one size, size fits all package with the pricing based on institutions historical print subscriptions. Unfortunately, those historical print subscriptions uh, tended to be um, rather inflated. So you're already starting at a high point going into the new format. So uh, advantages for the vendor. Obviously, it's going to generate steady revenue at a higher price than they previously pre received, so they, could, they have that guarantee of income. It also helps subsidize uh, underutilized journals or highly specialized journals that are very niche and might not have a large target audience. Um, it also tends to lock libraries into subscriptions. Uh, unfortunately, once you're into a big deal, it can be really hard to get out of it, and you don't want to lose content that you leased, right? You don't want to lose access. So, because we don't own it, we, we just leased it. And then, of course, it lowers administrative costs for tracking and maintaining access to e-journal subscription, which is one of the concerns that Dr. Veltrop uh, mentioned earlier. And then, of course, it simplifies the customer billing process. Rather than getting a line by line, uh, you know, long invoice, you get just maybe a lump sum with a general description, if you're lucky. Um, so, of course, that, those are all advantages for the vendor. So what's the advantage, what's the, what are the advantages for the library? 
Well, obviously, we gain access to a lot of journals that were previously unaffor unaffordable. And uh, Shu et al., uh, which is uh, one, the second article uh, a couple slides back, actually had an interesting statistic that I pulled out for this slide. Um, and it's basically that as a result of the big deal model, the size of serial collections in academic libraries increased almost, almost fivefold from 1986 to 2011. That is a big increase in access. So if you can reach a multi-year deal, then you also have the advantage of knowing what you're going to be paying for the, ter for the term of that subscription period. So at Binghamton, we know what we're going to pay, you know, two or three years out, and that's been very helpful. Um, and of course, as librarians, we all want to support scholarly and faculty publishing. So maybe there are journals we wouldn't always necessarily subscribe to, but because we have these package deals, they're getting ex extra subsidy. And then we also have the advantage of streamlining, streamlining workflow for staff. So yet we find ourselves in the pool of tears. So what happened? Um, in many cases, the annual increases still soared. They weren't really, you know, they were not, they were still within that five to 15% inflationary rate. Um, hadn't really saved us anything. So, of course, this led back to the vicious cycle of unsustainability. Um, we just could not keep up um, in terms of our budget. If there was an economic downturn, if enrollment was down, um, you know, that was going to lead to lead us to, to cut something. Um, and of course, that led us to the fact that the all or nothing approach didn't really leave us a practical way to trim costs. Uh, we had so much limited flexibility and you can't, you can't really drop or substitute titles like you can in the past. I mean, there might be something in your contract that says the vendor is allowed to switch out titles of comparable cost up to a certain percentage, but that was an advantage for them, not for us. And then, of course, we've all seen the consolidation of publishers. Um, that particular industry change has led to a lot of uh, monopolization uh, in certain fields. Um, and that is, you know, we need some competition to keep pricing down, right? And then, of course, we're still back in the outdated publisher pricing mo model. Um, you know, we're still being, paying based on what we paid for our print subscriptions, you know, 20 years ago. So, this has also caused a bit of erosion of trust um, after a couple of decades of having big deals. Um, you know, we're seeing things like, you know, incomplete title lists or, um, you know, lack of transparency in, the, transparency in the pricing. So we're not really sure exactly how much we're being charged per, for a journal title. You have to do a lot of legwork to get some of that information if your vendor is not forthcoming with it. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the rise of open access. Um, so that, of course, you know, leads us to additional content and, and, and what, how does that play into um, impacting our paid subscription material? All right. Um, based on what we saw and, and, you know, kind of the reality of the big deal that a lot of us are facing now, there are a lot of different lessons we can take away from this. Um, first of all, I think from a collection development perspective, it's always important to consider and understand the long-term consequences of decisions we're making. Um, boy, I was, I was a head of collections in a couple of institutions when we were making a lot of big deals. And I'm looking back at some of the decisions we made and, and wondering if I shouldn't have been more circumspect about, about looking ahead to the future and what inflationary results would be, that type of thing, in, in making those deals. Um, try not to beat ourselves up too much, however, because it's always hard. Hindsight's 2020, as we know. And so we, I, don't, I also don't think we should be too um, too hard on ourselves for, for not anticipating a lot of the issues that came up. Having said that, I do think that it's important to recognize trends that you're seeing in, in the economy and in your budget and to act on those trends when you see those happening. And the one thing I think we're a little more guilty of is, as academic libraries as a whole is not responding with enough alacrity to the situation and instead really waiting until we were reaching the point where we were being forced to cancel title uh, items as opposed to taking more proactive steps um, as individual institutions, but also collectively, where that collective organization existed to take those steps. And so I think, I think that that's something we can take away from this as well. As an individual institution, one of the things we've been thinking a lot about at Binghamton is really making sure that we're forming the right size deal for our institution, uh, regardless of the format that that deal is in. 
and at the same time acknowledging to ourselves that just because we can afford something, it looks really, really cool, we, we don't really necessarily have to buy that object. Always thinking about what the opportunity cost is of spending money on, on one item versus what we can do um, spending on other items. Um, yeah. In addition to that, <laughs> um, there were a couple of other events that happened recently that really helped uh, reinforce these lessons and really made us think even harder about them. The first one I've already alluded to, that was the budget cut that we had last year. Um, last year we hit a budget cut, it was $450,000 budget cut. Um, because we had had a number of budget cuts prior to that fiscal year, when we um, were approaching what to a, a cut, we very deliberately stayed away from cutting any firm orders because they had been hit really heavily in the past years. So we were limited to cutting uh, cereals and electronic resources as part of that cut. When we first began the cut, we didn't know the exact dollar amount, so it was 450000 as a base level with the potential of getting higher and the potential of having additional cuts in further fiscal years. And so as a result of that and knowing the economic situation where we were in, one of the conditions, and it was made very clear to us early on as we were trying to make this decision, that the sacred cows in our collection were actually up for grabs in terms of cutting. So for the longest time, our sage big deal was actually on the cutting board, and one of the items we were planning on cutting if we had to go beyond that $450,000 mark. Another uh, of our, our, our sacred cows was the, our, mes our membership in the Center for Research Libraries. That all re also would have represented a substantial savings for us. That too was also on the cutting block until we found out that we were going to get the lower, the lower number for the, for the cut. Um, it was a bit intimidating, obviously, to be looking at that, but at the same time, it was very liberating to know that, okay, we can consider all these big deals as part of the budget cut. Uh, one of the reasons, by the way, SAGE was singled out was because it was renewing that year, and, and it would have been very easy for us to cut that and eliminate that in order to meet the requirements that were being given to us by the campus for that, for that cut. So events like that, um, as well as the lessons, have, have really stressed to us at Binghamton about how critical it is to constantly be revising our collection development strategy and constantly asking ourselves essentially that same question that the Caterpillar asked, asked um, Alice, and that is, who are you? And so what we've been spending a lot of time of investigating and find out what the local information needs are and looking at our mission as a library and the campus mission to make sure that our collection development policies, our allocation of money, are all in alignment with the mission of the university and the mission of the libraries. And as part of this, what we've been doing is doing a lot of reassessing of our larger deals, including the, the big deals. Uh, looking at the big deals in light of our current budgetary system, where we forecast we're going to be in the future, and also, again, making sure that we're in keeping with the mission of the library. This has shown up in a number of different ways on our campus. In 2019, we com at the same time we were cutting the budget, we were also in the midst of a reallocation project. Uh, two of our colleagues, uh, Jill Dixon and Carol Ward, are going to be talking in a little more detail about this tomorrow. Um, so we won't, we won't go in too much, into too much detail about this, but essentially what we did was we did a lot of data crunching, both quantitative and qualitative data. We found a system or developed a system for ranking departments in such a way that we were able to, take, to get a good idea of departments that were either over or under allocated in, or overfunded or underfunded, and then we used that to go back and, and reallocate some of our budget funds. Um, it was work like this that um, really impressed upon us the importance of constantly um, tracking not only our budget situation, what's going on in the academic departments, but also making sure we're keeping a really good track of the research interests. Uh, the other thing I, I have become interested in tracking is the departmental revenue. This is becoming really critical on our campus. The departments are um, being allocated money based on the revenue they're generating through enrollment. So that's become a factor for us either in supporting the departments that are actually bringing in more students or departments that are perhaps struggling a little bit and need something else to entice those students to come to campus so that they can make those enrollment figures. The other way that this is starting to manifest itself is in deeper analysis of our collections. And this is part of the um, analysis that we're doing uh, for our, um, the Elsevier discussions that we have ongoing through the SUNY system. And this is, to me, just kind of fun with numbers. You just um, get some data and, and you start chopping it a variety of different ways. So we have a couple of different charts here. The first is just a rough market share calculation, um, adopting the, the calculation of market share from um, business um, calculations. And what I was doing was trying to determine how many periodicals made up 70% of our usage, or 70% of the market, essentially. And I found of the 3,100, approximately 3,100 journals, 
it took 400 to get to 70% of the usage that we were seeing on campus. Um, a lot of different ways that you could potentially interpret that, but a very interesting statistic for us to take a look at. It certainly implies that there are a number of journals that really aren't of interest to our departments on campus. Uh, similarly, also did analysis to check to see if we could start to identify some of the underperforming titles. And when we did that, we found, I'm laughing here because I think my less than sign has to precede these numbers as opposed to be after it. So apologies for that. But having said that, <laughs> um, one of the things I was looking for were underused journals. And so if you look at uh, journals, for instance, with less than 10 uses, uh, uh, nearly a third of the, actually about 40% of those um, journals, the 3,000 journals, had less than 10 uh, uses or less. And in this case, uses is also being defined as views of the full text HTML or PDF format. Again, indicating that this package, when you look at the interests of the campus, might not be a good fit for us across the board. There are a lot of journals that are obviously not of interest to a lot of the departments on our campus. Um, so constantly looking at things like usage patterns, deciding whether or not we're getting value for our money, and if we're not, starting to think about alternative ways. Starting to talk about opportunity costs a lot. If you're spending a million dollars on journals, what else could you be buying for the, those things? That's a lot of primary sources, for instance, and it's one-time purchases of primary sources if you're not doing that. And so, of course, there's also the cost of our staff. Um, it takes time uh, to actually come up with this data, harvest it, um, mill it, uh, make it usable. Um, so in order to support our, our decision-making process, um, we've been making workflow modifications, and I think these are, these are not unique to, to Binghamton by any means. Um, but basically, you know, we had changes to organizational staffing levels, and there are a lot of new tasks that support effective data gathering and analysis, uh, maybe that we didn't have to do with print serials. For example, uh, we didn't really have circulation usage for our print serials. Uh, you know, our usage statistics were uh, going and looking at what was placed on a certain a select table. We would ask users to, to please put uh, journals they had looked at um, on a certain table or a shelf, and then we would go and manually count them and kind of extrapolate that. Obviously, that's not really <laughs> helpful. Um, it has its limitations. Um, and we also used to have a large staff to handle print serials, doing check-in and processing and binding and that sort of thing. And now we have uh, fewer staff who primarily handle electronic resources. Um, they're more focused on e-books and e-journals and you know, setting up access to databases, uh, reading licenses, that sort of thing. Um, so there's now we have more of an emphasis on harvesting the vendor-provided metrics as well. Um, a lot of our uh, vendors are counter compliant, um, although some are not. So, but it takes time to go and, and set up the sushi harvester or you know troubleshoot su uh, sushi, you know, so that the autom automated harvester works, um, which doesn't always work. Thank you, technology. Um, and then we also have um, issues like system migrations. Uh, SUNY actually recently migrated from Olive to Alma. So that happened in July, and we're still getting our, our footing in terms of um, setting up our um, analytics dashboard. We do have some reports. Um, and there are a lot of robust reporting features, but unfortunately, um, while this enhances the quantitative data that we can upload, you know, we can calculate you know, CPU, we can look at our fund allocations and expenditures, but it doesn't really allow us to kind of marry the qualitative data or look at qualitative data, which I think has been long overlooked. Um, so that's, that's something that um, we are now uh, grappling with um, because we want to reconcile our metrics with the value. As I mentioned, we have standardized uh, usage st data and then we also have non-standardized, you know, page views, downloads, data sets, that sort of thing. Um, but then we haven't really, uh, you know, combine that with our qualitative measures. So one of the things we have um, begun doing is looking at, fac you know, key faculty activities. You know, where, what are they researching? Where are they publishing? What courses are they teaching? What do they need to prepare? Um, what are the curriculum developments? As Jim mentioned earlier, uh, we have several new programs. So what, what kind of support do we need to provide there? Um, and of course, you know, faculty also have their service commitments and personal interests. Um, so you really need to determine the extent to which the library's journal subscriptions are supporting these activities. We can't just say, oh, here's a big package full of titles and you'll find something in there, right? You know, because that may or may not be the case. 
So, and that brings us to the Cheshire Cat. Personally, the Cheshire Cat is one of my favorite characters ever. Um, so at one point in the, in the story, Alice and the cat have a conversation and she's asking for directions. And um, his only, you know, she says, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the cat's response is that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. So that seems like an obvious, um, you know, thing to consider, uh, but what are your goals and what strategies are available to you? Um, not all things um, are as straight cut as, as possible. So, there we go. Yeah? Okay. So, um, Jim? Were you... Okay. We, yeah, we did a last minute uh, divvy up. So let's. Uh... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So basically, um, when you're approaching, approaching negotiations, when Jim and I were talking about this, it seems like, um, you know, it's kind of like the, that game of croquet that Alice plays where there are no real rules and the balls are hedgehogs. And of course, she's playing with a flamingo mallet. So she doesn't really have any control over the situation and she doesn't do very well. So I think one of the things we, we have to acknowledge first is that we have limited control over external factors in this particular uh, situation. Um, I think it's also important, eventually Alice figures, kind of figures some stuff out and she establishes some internal baseline rules. So at Binghamton, we've, we've done something similar. Um, for example, you know, we have decided that all three-year deals, deals must be capped at 3% annual increases. Um, obviously, we always go for lower, but um, three is the maximum. Our dean of libraries would, would not permit anything over 3% for three years, no way. Um, so then we also have to understand how the content will or won't, will not meet our users' needs. It might be a great package. It might be, seem very reasonable if you break it down by CPU, but is it really supporting your curriculum? And thank you. No, I, I haven't read Alice in Wonderland, so I'd be really hard pressed to explain the croquet ground. Um, it's in been this rough for you, Yes, I yes, know. it has been rough. Um, <laughs> so, pardon me. And also, when you're looking at negotiations, negotiations, walking away can be complex and challenging, but it is always an option. And I had talked earlier about the budget cuts, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, but it is liberating to know that you have the option and your dean backs you back backs you in terms of walking away from one of those deals that's long been accepted as something that you have to maintain and that you um, don't want to go through that pain on campus of necessarily can canceling. So that's a very liberating th feeling. The other thing that's starting to come up more and more in terms of our negotiations is this feeling of solidarity or ethics. And, and not just looking at our institution, um, just SUNY Binghamton when we're doing the negotiating, but also thinking about what's going to be good for the SUNY system as well and what will be good for the other, uh, other academic institutions institutions, and in particularly in the case of some of the um, deals we're working on now, making sure we're not undercutting the SUNY system by going out on our own, forming deals that are going to make it difficult for them to negotiate in the future, or even setting bad precedents that are going to make it harder for us in the future and lead us down another, um, another road that's going to cause some issues for us. The other um, aspect of the negotiations is that we always um, have a communication plan when we're doing uh, large-scale negotiations. We want to make sure that we're communicating with our campus, uh, with our library faculty, and with the faculty on campus to let them know what's going on. It really benefited us during the uh, budget cuts because we kept in good contact with the faculty. We were constantly keeping them in the loop about what was going on. We're doing the same thing uh, with, with the Elsevier negotiations, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So now, um, just getting into, I mentioned we, we had a couple of different experiences with, with big deals. We wanted to just talk about a couple of them to kind of give some real life examples of, what, of what's going on. The first is, uh, case study, if you will, is, is the SAGE. I mentioned a little while ago that SAGE was actually on the cut list for us last year. And we were, at, at one point, really gearing up to, to have to cancel that, particularly, again, if that budget had got to come in over $450,000. We were just really out of good, good viable options that weren't going to hurt our collections. Um, and essentially, this is something where it went from being on the chopping block to a big deal that we actually wound up expanding. So as we were doing research on it, we realized that, yeah, it did actually check a lot of boxes for us. And we wound up, contrary to what we thought might happen, we wound up, first of all, expanding our subscription package in fiscal year 2019. By adding a couple uh, thousand dollars to it, we were able to get more access to the deep back files. And, this, and then the following year, we, we made a purchase, um, a one-time purchase, and actually bought the uh, permanent access to the deep back files. 
It's one of those really weird things, as you all know, with library budgets, that you can have a budget cut one year and then turn around and suddenly have $200,000 or so you can spend the next year. Um, it's, it's, and it comes usually from other parts of the budget, and, and that was Dean's money, one-time money that we had available to us. So it wasn't actually built into the, to the budget. Now, why did we have this turnaround with SAGE? Well, again, when we looked at it, we found that it checked a lot of boxes for us. We did like the collection priority. It fit well with our collection priorities. Being a liberal arts school, we liked the fact that um, it had a lot of a fairly good coverage of liberal arts. More importantly, a lot of good social sciences coverage and humanities, and um, our subject librarians were very interested in the back files for that. Price was reasonable, timing was right. As I mentioned, we had a little more money that we could spend on it. We were able to do things like lock-in increases, waive access fees, um, pretty standard things that a lot of us are doing right now. We found that, relatively speaking, SAGE was transparent and responsive during negotiations. Having said that, I have to admit it took me like two or three discussions to finally figure out the pricing model. Um, but <laughs> I am, and I know that sounds fun, funny, but it, and, I mean, once I got it, it was it was clear, and I was able to have good uh, substantial discussions with them, which was nice. Uh, even more importantly for us, when we did sign the agreement, we reduced the cost of our deep back files by 20,000, or our subscription by $20,000 a year, which was nice because essentially the deep back file is going to wind up paying itself off before I retire actually within the foreseeable future, which is, which is a really nice thing. And uh, a third project we're in the midst of is a renovation project. We have, to get, we have to essentially cut one of our floors in half in terms of the shelving space. So anything we can do to get rid of um, material, particularly discarding print journals, this really lent itself well to that. So again, there was a lot of strategic um, intersection with what we needed to do with our collections by, by doing this. And of course, in the future, if we truly need to, we can still cut this package if, 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 if you know, we really wind up um, with, a, with a very bad budget situation. Considerations. Oh, I did. Oh, I did. Okay. So um, we had an institutional case study, and now we have our consortial case study, uh, Elsevier. Um, everything I'm, I am about to say is um, public knowledge, just to reassure you. <laughs> um, so as Jim mentioned, we're currently involved in eval evaluating a rather large consortial pur purchase with our SUNY com uh, comrades. Um, the issues we're finding right now is that the price, um, there are two higher education systems in New York State. One is CUNY and one is SUNY. And because of the historical pricing um, issue, we actually have a large disparity. I believe SUNY is paying about three times uh, what CUNY is, just so you know. Um, and then, of course, this is compounded by the fact that uh, various SUNY campuses are facing financial difficulties. Enrollments are, are down a bit, so that has a significant impact on uh, the revenue available for them to contribute to a large package like this. And then, of course, there are open access provisions. Um, Elsevier is uh, committing to OA, um, and you have probably seen a number of um, articles and news items regarding those initiatives. And then, of course, transformative publishing, while it holds a great deal of hope, um, there's still a lot of challenges. It's, it's not, it hasn't solidified uh, yet in the way that um, would make us feel more comfortable. Um, in doing this. And of course, time is always of the essence. Our current contract ends December 31st of, of this year. So we are um, you know, hoping to be successful by that time, but we are, um, as I said, under a time crunch. So as a consortial member, um, I um, actually am on the Commercial Products Committee, uh, which is an, uh, a committee that was created by the SUNY Libraries Consortium Board uh, to address consortial purchasing and licensing agreements. Um, and that was back in 2017, so we're fairly new. Um, our full charge is available at that link. Um, but it's not just for Elsevier, it's also for other, you know, ACS and RSC and all, all these different um, vendors, you know, we're kind of going and looking out and seeing uh, what our campuses are interested in and what agreements they would like us to pursue. So, of course, that's a lengthy process. Um, as Jim mentioned earlier, SUNY is made up of 64 campuses and here you can see the breakdowns by the numbers. We have four university centers, 13 university colleges, 30 community colleges, and seven technology co uh, colleges. So of course this is, um, 
you know, it makes it even more difficult because there's a broader spectrum of curricula out there that we need to satisfy. And obviously, um, you know, a community college won't necessarily have the same, you know, research um, or teaching needs as a university center. So how do we reconcile that? Um, and that's actually one of the reasons that the CPC includes representatives from all of uh, the different school types. We have about 12 representatives, um, including those from SUNY Central. So it's, it's a fairly large group. Um, so of course, to get back to what our negotiations actually entail, uh, lots of communication. Um, we have all kinds of letters to campuses regarding our you know, negotiation developments. Um, we've already held a series of town halls back in uh, spring, and there is currently another uh, town hall series happening now. Um, the one at Binghamton, I believe, is going to happen, uh, I think, November 19th. Um, but that has to be confirmed. Another uh, interesting uh, development is that the university, fa the SUNY-wide University Faculty Senate recently re uh, approved a resolution. Almost, um, I think the vote was uh, only two opposed, but it's basically to say that they support CPC's efforts, that the SLC board is, um, you know, the path that the SLC board has us pursuing is fine with the larger SUNY community, so it's really nice to have that support. Um, and also, uh, the CPC members, we're looking at our campus's um, top use journals to see what is the, uh, basically the most used. Um, we're using our counter reports for that. Um, we're also calculating CPU, that still has a big hold, and we're, uh, you know, again, canvassing our survey to get their, um, their input. And then another thing that we are doing is uh, we are reconciling and verifying our post-termination access rights. Um, we do have PTA, um, however, different campuses have different PTA rights because of the model uh, and according to the contract, um, you know, if you weren't paying into it, and you join later, then your PTA doesn't extend as far back as, say, a campus that was paying individually for subscriptions going back to volume one, issue one. So um, what's our plan B? Um, that's a good question. Um, just to give you an idea, this is one of Binghamton's um, sample methodologies. Um, and you can see here, it includes usage from 2017 through 2019. And in this particular case, when we're comparing across campuses, we're seeing a, a bunch of duplication. There's some overlap. For example, um, I think all of the research centers have Journal of Power sources. We all have Lancet. Um, certain things keep cropping up, certain titles. So we're looking for that, that overlap to see what can be done and what really are the core titles kind of across SUNY. And then this is the last page of the spreadsheet I was just showing you. And you can see, um, this was kind of my quick and dirty tally. Um, you can see certain titles show trends year after year after year they show up. Every year, you know, every year since 2017, Acta Biomaterial Riala is, has been on the list. Um, alcohol has been on the list, um, that sort of thing. Um, so we're hoping that we can kind of develop a, um, determine a longer term trend um, by doing this and comparing our notes, our, our titles. Thank you. All right, and as that uh, negotiation is happening at the SUNY-wide level through the CPC, we're having a similar discussion um, at the local level on campus. And it's nice in a way because um, Stephanie and Curtis Kendrick, our, our dean, are both on the CPC. I'm not on that committee. I'm doing more of the local work in conjunction with Jill Dixon, our AUL, and doing a lot of outreach to the different departments. Uh, talked a little bit already about the data analysis that's going into some of the decision making, but a lot. In addition to that, a lot of what we're doing right now is, is, is communicating with different departments on campus. So we're working with the Library um, Advisory Committee right now, talking to them about the, the, process, the negotiations with Elsevier. We're talking to the Faculty Senate. This is helped by the fact that RAUL for Collections um, is, is, the, is the president of the Faculty Senate. It does, it does facilitate that discussion, which is, which is very nice. Uh, we have uh, talked to our individual library faculty members so they can have discussions with their departments. A lot of what we're doing is trying to get as much information out there as possible, building support for us, um, regardless of the decision we wind up making. And if they're not going to support, at least develop an understanding of the choices that we're going to have to make, not only just uh, um, at the local level, but as, um, on, on, at the SUNY level as well, so they understand what, what's going on. 
And as I mentioned a couple of times, it's not just considering uh, the financial issues. Even if things work out financially for us, we want to make sure we're doing the right things in regard to the consortium and to, and to others, um, well, to, our, to the um, SUNY consortium. So how is it likely to turn out? We've narrowed it down to two different possible outcomes. Lots of work went into that. Um, the, um, <laughs> we're, now, and obviously, um, the deadline is going to be December 31st. We're, we're, the negotiations are still going on. We're trying to be optimistic. Um, but we really don't know what's going to happen, and we want to be prepared at the local level. Um, so we're looking at a variety of different options uh, for Binghamton if we do get to the point where that contract is canceled. Talking about, as, as Stephanie was referring to, subscribing to a list of a, a key collection of key titles so at least we can get, you know, what would be 70, 50 to 60 percent of our usage, something along those lines. We're in the process of enhancing our interlibrary loan and document delivery services. We're joining Spark right now to, to assist with that. We're looking at alternative journals. Increasingly, we're pointing our faculty and students to open access journals, trying to increase awareness of that. Um, due to the, uh, the nature of this, I mean, there's so much use of this. Obviously, I don't think any one solution is going to be appropriate for us. We're going to have to enact a variety of different things at the, at the campus level in order to react. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, of course, in doing this, we're looking at um, places like the University of California system who have already been down this road and, and can provide us with a template for how we, how we can, the different possibilities. And so that's a big factor. I'm learning from other institutions who, who have already uh, been down this road and, and keeping up communication with them. Uh, hard pressed to actually try to summarize this, if you'd like to take no, no. <laughs> thanks. Um, but um, you know, thinking about um, our t discussions over the last year, a couple things come to mind. First of all, I, I, we talk a lot about the demise of the. Well, we, we hear a lot of different things about the big deal. We've, we've come convinced that the big deal is going to be with us for a while. It may change in different forms, and, and it may ebb and flow. But ultimately, there is some appeal to those larger package deals. And just as we um, increased our, our deal with Sage because it fit at the time, I, I can still see situations like that coming up. What's happening? is that we've become much more realistic about maintaining some of those big deals and, and I think much more willing as a campus with the support of our administration and the library administration, a lot, uh, much more willing to take the pain and, and talk to faculty and make those hard decisions. And in part, that's just because our budget can't sustain it anymore. I mean, we have no choice in some, and we, we may reach the point where there's just absolutely no choice, and then, and then um, you know, we really just have to do that. How we're trying to manage the future um, variables, um, we're trying, again, to really keep adjusting our collection development budget, understanding what's going on on campus, and making those adjustments that we need to to support new programs. Um, it perhaps um, help support lagging programs to see if they can increase their enrollment, for instance. Um, ongoing evaluation of all of our resources, including the big deals, in much more depth than we possibly would have done in the past, um, looking at, as we all do, looking at those renewal cycles is a chance to, to, to really um, to negotiate for what we need uh, from those deals. And ultimately, again, it always goes back to us now with that ability to walk away and, and knowing that we have the support really does help. And so the process that we're going through right now with Elsevier, um, I think it ultimately will help us in the end because we'll have this communication open with the faculty, with the campus, with the other SUNY systems. So regardless of where we wind up, we have that communication going on. And ultimately, that may wind up being the most valuable part of what we're doing right now with all of this communication. And I know we're really at the, um, toward the end of time. We're over time. We're over time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> with, with the, um, Required Godzilla slide. Um, yes. We'll go ahead and end the I presentation. Kaiju fans. So. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you all very much for yes, listening. Thank you. And if you have um, any questions or comments. Can yeah. Yes. I don't know if we do, but <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry.